the shake, rattle and troll. It's time for the award-winning shake, rattle and troll. Here's the A show for the serious fishermen as well as the novice looking for tips from the pros. Shake, Rattle, and Troll brought to you by Bill Luke Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram. I-17 and Camelback Road since 1927. Yeah, we've got the power, we've got the speed, we're running wide open on a midsummer breeze. Fresh water, soft water, watch out boys. Bass Daddy Don's gonna make some noise. me and the boys gonna shake, rattle and your host, saltwater fisherman, the man that fears no fish, bass daddy and tournament pro, Don McDowell. All righty, hey, I'm Don McDowell. Welcome to a special edition of Shake, Rattle, and Troll uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, JK's in the house, and, 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 and you wonder why it's special? <laughs> Because I got up this uh, morning. Yeah, oh, I'm <laughs> telling you. We're still It here. was a long day yesterday. We're getting the uh, Shake, Rattle, and Troll uh, 2500 Ram ready to roll up to... Uh, Pine Top on Monday, and uh, it's special today because we have Commissioner Kurt Davis with us from uh, the uh, Board of Commissioners from Arizona Game and Fish Department, and we have our friend, uh, albeit he's a ranger driver, he's driving a really huge Dodge. That's plus and minus right there. You can put your, <laughs> your car in the back of that. That is a huge truck. It's big. Terry B. Johnson. <laughs> nice to be here. Welcome, Wolfman. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and Commissioner, here, just so I want to paint this picture. Last time he was here, he admitted that he was the sole originator of this whole wolf issue. You and Mr. Heffelfinger, was that not correct? Yeah. No, Heffelfinger That's what was you nowhere said. close. He wasn't. No. Okay, who was no, it? It was me and uh, Dave Parsons and uh, Bobby Holiday. And you were in Mexico, were you now? Well, I was with Dave Brown. Okay, you're going way back right. to where yeah. I started. Dave Brown. I was down That's in, the, in the Sierra Madre, and we were down there looking for thick-billed parrots and grizzly bears and, uh, and wolves. Yeah, yeah. In Mexico, grizzly bears. Yes, Mexico grizzly bears. We were down in the Sierra del Nido, and that was the last There's place that, uh, that grizzly bear was, was seen by Starker Leopold. Or that's where the search was. Ah. But, uh, was that on the uh, agave uh, farm? N- no, it wasn't on the agave <laughs> farm. There were other farms that were just developing down there, but we were just outside the Mennonite colony. And, uh, what? Really? Yeah. Yeah, there's a huge Mennonite colony down there in Santa Clara uh, grasslands. And that's uh, the area uh, from there on south is where Rory McBride brought those last Mexican wolves back into captivity in 77 through 80. Wow. But we were down there, and we were just prowling around looking for, for things. I was at um, in the last year developing the, the non-game program for the state as, Correct. A, as a contract employee through the Nature Conservancy. Uh-huh. And we turned it over, and Dave had just uh, finished writing. He's actually reviewing the galleys at that po- at that point on his book about the Mexican wolf in the Southwest. That's where it came and from. And we were we were talking about the the fact that the the grasslands at night, crystal clear, and we're as always drinking beer and talking and over the campfire, were so silent in uh, in comparison to what they might have been if the, if there had been wolf howls to hear. And uh, we were looking at it from the standpoint of uh, restoration. And Dave was extremely negative, which comes across in his book. Didn't think there was any possibility that anybody would ever have the nerve to do it. And I was enough of an egotist. Kind of threw that. The, uh, surprise, surprise. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we we made a bet eventually. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Did money really change hands? No. Okay. It, it still hasn't. We're, we're now... Both of us old enough. Four con- decades well, later. Well, both of us now were contesting what the bet actually consisted of. Yeah. So neither one of us has paid off yet. But my, my bet was that uh, that I could actually see the the wolf reintroduction thing through to a decision by the Arizona Game and Fish Commission, whether it was yes or no. But I thought that it could be done, and he didn't think it could even Okay, even so you did all this, and now you're blaming it, blaming it on the commission. No, 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 no. no see no. how this works, Commissioner? The, the, the commission... Uh, has always voted in favor of the wolf actions, but they're always in favor of wolf actions by the department that were responsible. Right. What none of us anticipated was, is how much of an impasse to actual constructive change Fish and Wildlife Service would become. That's the missing piece here. We never, never anticipated that we would not be able to be the actual wolf managers on the ground from our, from the get go. Uh, we anticipated, in fact, it was the way that the original agreements were written that the Arizona Game and Fish Department would be in charge of the reintroduction project on the ground in Arizona. And the omnipotent federal sourcing <clears throat> came into play and decided, hey, this is our ballgame. An attorney who became the regional director wearing red cowboy boots, Nancy Kaufman, 
uh, and Dave Parsons, the at that time the recovery coordinator, uh, made some changes in the MOU at the last second, and unfortunately the department signed it. That was bam. Just, that was over my protest. So bam, bam, bam. Does that go back to the Go Lightly Commission days? No, it, it precedes, everybody. precedes everybody. It precedes everybody. We're talking about Fred Baker, Francis Werner. And we're talking about Ooh, old times, and we're talking yeah, about we're talking about eighty seven, eighty well, eighty five to eighty seven. I was a young man back then. Yeah, so. But we never anticipated that. Though. Well, Terry, you hit on something, and I'm going to be brief on it. That that's one thing that uh, you know we're we're looking at on the on the outside that I know the commission and the department's uh, looking at on the inside is going back and rewriting these MOUs where the department signed their ability to manage game and fish away to other agencies. And from a from a private sector standpoint, I'm I, I'm pretty upset. Well, let me help you with that upset, Don. I don't mean to cut no, you off. Here comes the acid, Don. Yeah. Well, there, there's, a, there's another element to this, and this comes directly from uh, from Benjamin Tuggle, and his attorney, Benjamin, is, of course, the regional director in Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is God's truth. Uh, and and it, uh, he has said specifically to me about MOUs that they signed that they are not binding on Fish and Wildlife Service, that if Fish and Wildlife Service decides that it wants to operate outside a signed MOU, then it's the other signatory's responsibility to either withdraw or accept it. Well, and that is straight from him and his attorney. If you don't like the way the game's being played, we're going to take our balls and go. Yeah, let's change it. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they'll change it. Well, we can't. Terry, that may be the case with uh, the wolf issue, but there, there are a number of other cases that don't apply to the Fish and Wildlife Service that apply to the uh, uh, Forest Service and and other agencies, uh, NGOs that are sticking their fingers in the pie right now, a- and have been for a long time. Don, and Don, the one good thing I I don't I think you've probably noticed that there are no MOUs signed by the department with any of the federal agencies that don't have two elements in them any longer. One is is an admission by the federal government in the MOU that uh, Game and Fish Department <clears throat> and the Commission have primacy over. Wildlife in the state of Arizona. That's in every now in every MOU. Very good. It can't be signed without it. And uh, number two to that is is the reverse. What Terry brought up, which is if if the state is uncomfortable with the behavior and the actions of the federal government in this MOU, then then the state obviously maintains its right uh, to withdraw. Um, and so I, you know, there is now that's that's stand, you know, that's SOP now, um, and it has been f- for a while. But that's something. If you if you go to a commission meeting, you'll notice that's the first thing that most of us ask in the MOU. We've read it, but we're just redundant in the public meeting to make sure that that language is incorporated in any MOU. And it's unfortunate that you have to actually state. The obvious or the truth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, But you have to. And by the way, for those who don't know these little acronyms that we're going to be utilizing today, USFSWS is United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and MOU is Memorandum of Understanding, which is the legal document that we typically go by when dealing with the federal agencies or anybody. Yeah. Okay. Well, since we're all learning new words, the the new word for the day is Dunkachino. I learned that today at Dunkin' Donuts. (laughs) I'm just saying. The sophistication <laughs> level sometimes is wanting on this end. you got to love hot maple bars. I, I, I appreciate them. Well, we're, we're going to get into the uh, uh, Mexican gray wolf issue on, on thank you, Terry, for establishing how it started, where it is today, uh, where we think it's going. Uh, on the Shake, Rattle, and Troll website, uh, we've gone to an effort to explain the issue uh, as, as Terry has uh not necessarily clear back to 1985, but maybe 1995-98 on uh, what the issues are in plain English. Uh, the maps, there's a series, I think, four Fish and Wildlife Service maps. There's the uh, cooperating agency map up there that the department, the commission, and uh, ESA has come up with, which is, a, you know, I think a pretty solid plan um, with a population cap, uh, a core range established and management protocols uh, if a wolf happens to not be literate enough to read the map gets outside the the range uh, how he's going to be managed and uh, that that's the good news um, we've got a uh, 
one of the wolf summits in uh, Pine Top. At starting at two two to four is the first round on Monday the eleventh, uh, and then there's a six to nine. Uh, what are they doing at six to nine? Six to nine, you get to file your comments, and that's going to be by luck of the draw if you get to speak. Otherwise, you basically can sit there and listen to people give their three minutes worth as to why they feel what they Do you feel. have to use your own name? Because every time I put Dom McDowell in there, there I see... I, yeah, I know. Yours gets <laughs> tossed, mine gets tossed. Things flipping into the trash tossed. basket, and I never get to talk. But I've noticed that Sandy Barr gets to speak two times. If you get representation from the federal agency and they can't make it and Sandy Barr is the designated speaker, then, of course, you get to do that. Otherwise, it's the luck of the draw, and her luck is just phenomenal. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, as we go through uh, the program today, uh, roll call, as always, we have uh, two soldiers that we will uh, tell you about that died uh, last week in uh, in theater. We have uh, Vernon Bagley going to join us a little bit more of an update on the VA situation and getting away from all that serious stuff. We're going to talk about the tuna whacking that's going on uh, over off the uh, left coast out of San Diego. Uh, we'll start with Captain Bill on the Malahini. Uh, talk to Rick at uh, H&M Landing at the Tackle Shop. And then we're going to... We can we can talk about tag, uh, t- returning your tags, unused tags, Who can't we? Yep. I was so glad, J.K., I thought of you. I didn't, didn't call you. Uh, and I apologize for that. But my deer tag came in the mail along with my turkey tag. <laughs> and, and be sure to thank the commission. Thank you, Commissioner, for nothing. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm Don McDowell. Special K. Kurt Davis. Terry Johnson. We're going to thank some of our sponsors, including Bill Luke, Chrysler, Jeep, and Dodge I-17 and West Camelback Road. Uh-huh. Yep. Since 1927. We'll be right back. And it goes to All righty, we're back. Uh, Captain Bill's uh, apparently at the bait receiver uh, headed out in the Malahini uh, for a three-quarter day trip. Um, I'll tell you what they did on uh, Friday that was uh, established yesterday, and then we'll uh, talk to Rick a little bit about it. Uh, the uh, three-quarter day boats, they had five boats out, 138 anglers. Their uh, fisherman or stick-to-fish ratio was uh, three fish per stick. They had 90 yellowtails, 287 yellowfin tuna. That That's within a 20-mile range. I mean, these guys were not running offshore. No, no they're, they're just going past the islands, yeah. you said. Uh, five Dorado, and then uh, for the guys that weren't chasing uh, tuna uh, out on the half-day boats, um, and, we, and we don't talk about this uh, very often, there was 13 anglers on one boat. They caught 76 calico and 53 bonita which was 10 fish per stick. They were busy. You know, I mean, that that's good stuff. Yeah. That, that's really good stuff. And and while we're on it, the um, day-and-a-half boats had uh, 144 anglers out. They averaged uh, 6.6 fish per stick, 720 yellowfin, uh, 95 dorado, 130 yellowtail. And and here here's the kicker. This will keep you awake tonight. The, the day boats mm-hmm. go out, come back all day. There were seven boats out, 175 anglers, 645 yellowfin tuna, 65 yellowtail, 36 dorado, and uh, we've got an asterisk on 20 bluefin tuna that were caught in U.S. waters, not in Mexican waters. So my guess is instead of going out turning left, going into Mexico, they went out turning right, right and stayed uh, in the shore. So four, uh, yeah, about four, four point four fish per stick you know this this is as good as fishing has been over there in at least a decade it's global warming yeah absolutely it is got to be right uh, along with uh you know a 65 percent increase commissioner on the polar ice caps and they got warmed up and refroze i guess I it got cold for a while there okay so um on the 11th um well, I tell you what. Let's talk about the press release that came out last week from the uh, commission. That was uh, commissioner very well stated. I, I suspect there was some wordsmithing that went on over a period of time regarding that document. But why don't you expound on that for us? Well, I think that what the document tried to do was, you know, and as you know, 
everybody here knows it's an extraordinarily complicated issue and wanted to make sure that it was clearly articulated that there are options available to the commission and the department related to this issue. It's not simply a decision of our friends at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that there are things that can and, and will occur if um, – they continue down the path they're on, which is to completely ignore yes. um, the stakeholders and uh, the alternative. Um, and if that happens then or continues to happen, then these other series of events, which include potential congressional uh, action, which could happen, all the way down to states withdrawal from the entire process. And if the state withdraws, it will not be successful. At the end of the day, it, it will not be successful. And hopefully some brighter minds will, will come to that conclusion within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I have a question, and that is, I mean, this really, for all appearances, based on the documents that we had provided to the federal government and based on their responses, um, for an analogy, it's like they kick sand in your face. Absolutely. I, I viewed it that way, and I used pretty strong language. At the commission meeting, I described it as fraud. Um, it is a fraudulent process to ask people to provide alternatives, ask those people to work as cooperators in providing an alternative, use science, uh, use uh, the history um, that the program has, has dealt with, deal with, you know, real terms like historic um, range. range, those yeah. kinds of things, and to provide all of that in a meaningful rational um, proposal and to not accept not one, not one of any of the significant no. uh, provisions or alternatives provided is it was kicking sand in the face of people who committed a lot of time and effort and who are dedicated to wanting to see some form of success. And that's the thing that's lost in all of this is what really is success. From this commissioner's standpoint, success is... 50 years from now, 100 years from now, you look back and say that that there are wolves in the historic range, which means the mass majority of them are south of the border. Correct. And that Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas um, are participants in in the the smaller, you know, 20 percent, 10 to 20 percent of the range, historic range. That would be success and the reestablishment of the species. That would be success. If that's not the objective, if the objective is to have a small farm in the United States of America. Commonly called Arizona and New Mexico. Yeah, that is not success. No. And if you are an advocate for the wolves, to believe that that is success is, I just can't even comprehend that. So th that's what where the commission is trying to get the focus to be, which is, how do we reestablish the species where the species roamed? Um, and that, that's the simple, fundamental piece of this. And, that, and what they are putting on the table does not achieve that, won't achieve that, and will be abject failure at the end of the day. And just as a little bye-bye, um, I did some reading on Doc Hastings, who's a congressman out of one of the northern tier states, and he's in charge of the – or he chairs the natural resources – and he pointed out that uh, since 1973, there's been over 1,500 species listed as endangered and that only 2% have been recovered, which means that basically 33 out of the 1,500 species listed have survived or have been considered recovered, and the rest are still sitting there. The trillions and, of and dollars and add, committed to that. And add to that that of the successes, the successes have been driven and dominated and instituted uh, primarily under the state's, state's authority. That th That's the other piece that's missing here. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't have 
alone does not have the ability and, 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 and a proven track record of not having the ability to get the job done. No, they don't have the manpower. All they do is simply commit. Uh, there are edicts that come out from them, and I consider that an arrogance on their part with the assumption is is that we will follow suit, basically because they have spoken. The, the number one thing that people can point to if, again, we believe that science is to be the guide, history or historic, uh, you know, historic range is to be the guide, to remove Texas from the, the, the federal plan is, it, is to ignore science, is to ignore connectivity of the range. And the only conclusion that a rational person can come to is you remove Texas because they have a really large congressional delegation. Absolutely the case. And you don't want them interfering in don't the process. Don't rock the boat, baby. And so there again, that's a decision not built on science. That's a decision built solely on politics. Terry, you did some studying on that. How what Texas was a part of their historic range. Well, Texas is part of the historic range. There's no question about that. The question is, is there a habitat in, in Texas that's uh, suitably um, available for Mexican wolf uh, habitation at this point? And I would differ with the, with the commission and the department on this issue and have for a number of years. The uh, There is no likelihood that wolves would be established in any meaningful number in Texas at this point. The, the, they, uh, they don't get along well with feral hogs? No, they haven't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The hogs are bigger. One would hope they would. But uh, in that particular part of Texas, uh, it's, it's really a minimal thing. And, and, and I look at it from another perspective as well, and that's cost effectiveness. And the cost effectiveness of, of reintroduction and progress, progress toward recovery is um, – that's to be gained in Arizona and New Mexico where the habitats are richer. But you still have to respect, if again, if we're going to respect the historic range, connectivity to Mexico, to simply politically remove something from the map is, is ridiculous. Well, there are, there are two elements of that, a couple of, uh, several elements of that. But uh, to say that uh, Texas is not part of the historical range, I would never agree with that. To say that Texas should not be included in the 10J boundary, the, the non-essential experimental population boundary, there's an argument to be made that Texas should be in it for its own protection. But when you begin identifying wolf management zones and focal points for reintroduction and recovery, that's where I differ from bringing Texas in. First line, okay, boys. Okay, hold Hang that on, thought. boys. More on the Wolf Wars when we come back. <laughs> All righty, we're back. The uh, Wolf War continues uh, behind the scenes, behind the mic, during the break, and here we go again. Here's what we're doing um, from Shake, Rattle, and Troll trying to Educate the, uh, the 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 public to uh, to a certain extent. The non-engaged public. Well, yeah, you know the problem is, you know, I talked to Doug yesterday, and uh, you know we're doing all of this, and you know, like we're sitting here talking. I made the assumption uh, inadvertently, and and not a conscious uh, assumption that everybody knows about the problem. They don't. And uh, he had a comment made to him up in Southern Utah, which is uh, basically anti. Uh, recovery in within their state the guy said so what's the problem eh. okay so so my my bulb comes on and and uh, we're, we're having to take this back for uh mexican gray woods for dummies if you will my whole library is with microsoft for dummies this for dummies i've come to the conclusion that all nah, right i'm not going to say it out all right <laughs> so what we've tried to do is is uh, on the website explain the issue and for those that uh, understand the issue uh, we're asking uh, Monday uh, on the 11th between the hours of 8 a.m. and uh, 10 10 a.m. that folks call in exercise uh, a unified voice to um, the Mexican Wolf Program headquarters in Albuquerque uh, we've given their phone number Department of Interior Secretary Jewel we have her phone number Congressman Paul Gosar and uh, Matt Salmon's office, and uh, I don't think we have to worry about either Gosar or Salmon. Uh, I, 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 John, I, I agree with that, but they need to be uh, urged 
nudged, if you will. And, and I think the big thing here here is uh, is to leave the emotion uh, out of it. There, there's a lot of emotion out, out there on both sides. I'm going to shoot wolves, and we got to have you know a bazillion wolves on on the other side. But I think uh, number one is emphasize that we don't support. Uh, the recent uh, DEIS uh, with the extended range, the lack of a population cap or uh, uh, management protocols that, that we agree with. On the other hand, uh, talking point number two would be that we do support the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the commission, and the cooperating agencies' alternative uh, plan as submitted in final draft, and, and you guys did an awesome job on that. Thank we you. do support a population cap of no more than 300, split between Arizona and New Mexico, and uh, we do support adding the cooperating agencies plan uh, with their management methods and protocols uh, to the uh, Forest Service plan, and, that, and probably the most key thing, we support management by the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the commission in the state of Arizona only, period, bottom line. Let them know. Uh, on the SRT website, you can click on Wolf Wars and, and get this information with the phone numbers. And uh, It's a couple of phone calls, and, and I think we're uh, – <clears throat> there, there's a new TV series that I'm really looking forward to. It's called The 60s. Oh. Well, Scott, I know, Scott, scoffing is not a bad thing, but, you know, there was a lot of good done in it. it Albeit done by protest, sit-ins. I mean, what would happen at the Capitol, or let, let, a commission meeting, Terry? Mm-hmm. What what if we got a hundred bass fishermen with trucks and bass boats and clogged the highway going into a commission meeting? Now, and let's say the lead truck happened to be a a, a big ram or a truck. ranger boat. <laughs> Happen to have a mechanical malfunction and ran out of fuel. Or either that or and maybe the Michelin tire blew up on them and took out <laughs> okay. the rear quarter. Is somebody going to listen? Absolutely, they're going to listen. They're going to listen, but you're also going to take it in the shorts in terms of, of public perception. Because I, I understand the point that you're making. I really, I think I do. Okay, you do. You, yeah. you're, you're from the 60s. I'm from the 60s. I know. I, I know am. that. Yep. That's not painting your beard. No. <laughs> no. I'm just saying it, it. It's high time that we uh, reengage uh, uh, all our, the uh, lawmakers, and, and I think uh, on that countdown, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's time for people to actually reengage. The silent majority crap uh, just doesn't cut it. Silent it's majority not. does not rule. It's the vocal minority that rules, and that's true across the country in, in virtually all areas. And we have an issue because the side that is anti-hunting is phenomenally well-funded, based, based on the yeah. biggest lie of all, which was the Humane Society of the United States. Yeah. And then we have the other – a good example, Don. I got a, a message from a guy who listens to our show every Sunday. Um, is not a hunter. Is not a fisherman, but likes our attitude towards the government. His name's Brandon Selbo. And you hey, Brandon. To, yeah, so I mean, give a shout out to those types of people who understand. They are not engaged the way we are. They are right. people who just simply, by their non comments, give us the ability to do the things that we love to right. do. And that, that's crucial. But there are a couple of elements there. One is, is go back to your comment about uh, you, you, the comment that was made about maybe you can trust uh, salmon. And, and whoever it might be to, to do the right thing. I would, I would say that you can't trust anybody. Oh, I wouldn't say right trust, thing. but I would say that based on the comments yeah. that I've – and the discussions yeah. I've had with Congressman Salmon, he is firmly in our corner. Yeah. There is no question there. The question that I do have is will his natural resources advisors and the rest of the staff, right. what are their hearts? Where are their hearts? I know where Congressman yeah. Salmon's are. I don't know where everybody else works I know works where it goes is yeah they they will be there but they need to continue to hear from people that they're they're on yeah. the right page with this stuff and and have that support all along and then people have to do the other thing and that's put their their money where their mouths are or their pens yeah, even attending the meetings on on uh, Monday in in Arizona or on the 13th on Wednesday in New Mexico that's performance art and ultimately it has very little impact on the right. actual decisions yeah. that are made. What they've got to do is be able to be willing to put their money behind folks that are going to litigate this issue because litigation is what's going to see, see this through. Uh, the next uh, six months are just going to set the stage for a variety of litigation. And then that was my one of my other questions, and that is is that based on what we've seen so far from Fish and Wildlife, uh, Commissioner Davis, you know, at what point do you feel there will be litigation? Because I don't see anything happening in terms of congressional or legislative. I think it's going to be filing suit. 
I, I absolutely agree, and to, and to Terry, he he's absolutely right. I mean, the, I want to go back to the the public hearing, which it, it, it is a fun exercise in people being able Venting. to to vent. Yeah, but at the end of the day, it's a check on the box of something they have to do in the process to justify uh, the decisions they're going to make, and the decisions they're going to make are not going to be ones that. Most of us are going to sit around the table and say we really like them. We're Commissioner, let me ask you this. Is, uh, litig- litigation is absolutely part of an overall strategy. It's a process that we have to go through. It, and, it, and it will be part of a strategy. And I think congressional action um, is also part of a litigation stra- or part of an right. overall strategy. That would be going after the Western Caucus. Uh, yeah, you know the, these issues, though. You know it's interesting. These these kinds of issues now bleed well beyond even you that. know the Mississippi River. People, the, yeah. the the these the the idea the idea is, is beginning to set hold with a lot of members of Congress of both parties that the destruction of all else for the benefit of one mm-hmm. uh, is not a good policy in anything that we do. I mean, we're talking about, for example, just a moment ago, you know, management, management protocols. We have management protocols for all kinds of species. When you talk about management protocol for wolves, people go nuts. Yes. We have management protocols for all kinds of species, coyotes, mm-hmm. management uh, protocols for bears, management, I mean, this is normal wildlife management behavior has to be – people would go nuts if you didn't have wild uh, management protocols if we were dealing with this particular we don't want, problem. Yeah. And based if on what I said – If gets eaten at a bus stop – Yeah, we got issues. Yeah. – in town A or town B, they're going to ask what are the management protocols yeah. to deal with. So whenever I hear pe- – but sometimes when you have to use this language – it, based on one small, you know, part of the issue, people misconstrue, and this is a classic one. People misconstrue what you're talking about. Right. Well, the other side of that too is that if you put protocols in place, then people rightfully ask, "Well, why the hell didn't you honor the protocol you put in place?" Absolutely. And in this particular case, there are a number of elements of protocol for the, the Mexican Wolf Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service Region Two, has consistently ignored. And uh, that then causes uh, the opposition on the other side. The folks are actually being impacted by their failure to act in accordance with the own, own rules, uh, their own rules. And this goes back to the 1998 Mexican Wolf Management Plan that they approved unilaterally, and uh, they don't operate in consistent with that. So, and so provides what? prime, prime, prime legal um, uh, uh, fruitful fields to be operating. In. Yeah. So Terry, why now like they're changing the rules? Why are they? Yeah, extraneous pressure from the other side. Well, you have to go back in the Job history. Security. This rule that we're operating under was established in 1998, and it was intended to be revised in 2001. One. Yeah, it hasn't and, been revised in And Fish and Wildlife Service has opted. They had a draft rule ready to go in 2001, and for political reasons, they sat on it, never took it to the public. It's still, I've still got a copy of it. But uh, it was also supposed to be revised several times since then, and they've never taken it on. Now they have no choice because of a court settlement. Again, Game and Fish was not a party to that settlement, even though they should have been a party to it. And so Fish and Wildlife Services agreed by January 15, 2015, they will have a new uh, Mexican Wolf uh, 10-J rule to operate under. So this is minimal compliance. All righty. Uh, save that. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk to Vern Bagley on uh, VA uh, issues. Uh do roll call and back on the Wolf Wars after the top of the hour. I'm Don McDowell. Special K. Kurt, I want, I want to hit on Section 6. <laughs> we'll be back. I live back in the woods, you see. A woman and the kids and, and the, the dogs dog. and me. Everybody sing. That's the new <laughs> national anthem presented by, yes, sir, shakerallandroll.com. Listen, before we get going, uh, I will be at the Wolf meeting again. I don't know how many I've gone to, but uh, I would like to, since you're the initiator or the instigator, (laughs) we're going to give you one of the uh, new Shake, Rattle, and Troll. uh, Wolf shirt. Wolf shirts. And and Commissioner, there is yours. Thank you, sir. And there will be one for each one of the commissioners, director, and uh, Jim DeVos. (laughs) And what we're we're trying to make a political statement. 
in response to the Center for Biological Diversity sending me an email wanting me to pass out condoms that says wrap with care, save with polar bear. Wolf condoms? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, there's a thought. Yeah. Weren't they, I thought they were utilizing those anyhow. They've only grown. <laughs> well, my, my point back to the CBD was I, I was uh, I'm willing to engage only if you practice what you preach. You use the condoms because you guys are proliferating my space. There's too many of you. So what we're doing here, we have a uh, don't uh, get into sustainability or sustainable development. Yeah. We have uh, a new slogan for the Mexican gray wolf, no, am- no amnesty, send them south, which is consistent with uh, Commissioner Davis's, uh, uh recovery efforts. Ninety percent of this needs to be back in Mexico, so we need to send them south. And that's where they belong. Uh, they belong in the north as well, but uh, south is where they, they should. Yeah, they, Only they, if they uh, have a green card. Uh, yeah, well, the they 10%, can be a green card. I, I can deal with 10% of any of their species. Oh, I mean, yeah, if they get right. 1,000 you know, of them in Mexico, I'm more than happy to have the 100 here. Yeah. Well, having said that, you know, one of my uh, big thoughts, uh, consistent with Commissioner Davis, you know, there, there, there's a place on the planet for all God's creatures, properly managed. And that includes us. Properly managed. By yes. the way, we were going to talk. We talked during the break about Section Six. Do you want to get sure. into that? Sure, uh, I'd love to get into that. Section Six is a is an act, a section of the Endangered Species Act, that speaks to the state's involvement in conservation, and it's very explicit uh, in terms of what the state can do. In fact, it it authorizes the state to manage threatened species virtually without uh, without specific guidance from Fish and Wildlife Service. It identifies where, how they can manage, including take, which mm-hmm. is, can be killed, capture, remove, whatever. And it authorizes that, uh, the, the state to do that with threatened species for a very good reason. That's what Congress intended, that the bulk of the management on the ground would be carried out by the state agencies. It also establishes that the state is required to maintain an active, an adequate and active conservation plan for all of the species that are listed in the state. And in, in that agreement, it specifies that Fish and Wildlife Service is supposed to collaborate with the state in developing. So one would think that a state management plan uh, or, or approach, a, a, an alternative, let's say, for the, the environmental impact statement developed by the state with some of its cooperators would have great weight in an environmental impact statement process. And, in fact, that's the very document that Fish and Wildlife Service has absolutely ignored, ignored in constructing. They've taken a few little elements out of it and tweaked some definitions and improved them in doing so. But, by and large, they have, as has been said earlier, kicked not only sand, they've kicked mud, dirt, gravel, and everything else that they can possibly do in the face of the states. that the Arizona Game and Fish, I should say, the only active uh, state uh, participant in this process. And that's uh, that. That's an issue that the states have chosen never to litigate. What does adequate and active mean? Well, and in this particular case, you've got a state that's been involved with wolves on the ground since they hit the ground in January of 2011, uh, of 1998, excuse me. Yeah, I was going to say. And has been engaged in spending up to half a million dollars a year, a little bit more in some years, actually 750 to 800,000 was the max when I was in charge of the program. Uh, we had uh, we had that because we were building an office and doing things like that. You can't say that that's not adequate and active. And they've defined their their procedures for handling wolves. We've got about uh, 30 protocols out there, procedures, SOPs we call them, in existence. And they have interacted repeatedly. You talk about you know how, you know how many wolf meetings you've you've been to. I, let me t- I, I've lost count. Well, let me tell you. I held more than a hundred wolf meetings before the wolves ever even hit the ground yeah. in Arizona and New Mexico, and I was the only guy speaking at all of those for one very good reason: I didn't trust anyone else to speak accurately about it. And if there were flaws in, in the presentation, there was only one guy accountable. That would and be that, you, and that worked well. Now you've got a situation, and we had uh, when we did the scoping for the EIS in 1996, and, well, the scoping in 92, and we had the EIS. We went we went through dozens of public meetings. We held multiple scoping meetings in uh, 2005. We did it again, 2007, with with multiple scoping meetings throughout the two states. Fish and Wildlife Service has now boiled this process down to the minimal compliance in terms of public engagement, and that's not what was intended by NEPA. NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, that dictated 
that the, the federal agencies would have sufficient interface with the public that they could measure public opinion on these issues and take that into consideration in making decisions. Terry, 16 years later, why the hell are we still doing this? Because Fish and Wildlife Service has simply swept the Mexican wolf under the under the, the carpet repeatedly to, to, to address other issues because it's just a blip on mankind. We talk about how important Arizona and New Mexico are. They are not that important when it comes time to to look at congressional pressure. The, the the leaders of the caucuses, the leaders of the of the appropriations, natural resources for decades have been in the Northwest. Right. That's exactly why the Northern Rockies got millions of dollars to do their EIS in this region. Had to wait 15 years to get a nickel. Uh, so that you can you can spread the blame around considerably. The other thing is, you can look at the secretaries of the interior. When Secretary of the, of the Interior Ann Norton was in charge, back in in the 90s. That's when the, the decision was made that the Mexican wolf would not move forward because she didn't want wolves in her home state, Colorado. So that swept it under the, the – I mean, we've had those those things yeah. occur throughout the, the, the process here. Each individual wave of, of effort to do something with Mexican wolves has been negated by litigation in the Rockies, uh, Secretary Norton's uh, decision uh, at that point. I mean, each one has had its problems. Now – those things have been largely, not entirely, but largely resolved with delistings of the gray wolf elsewhere. Right. And now that now's the time for Mexican wolf to come to a head. Commissioner, comment? No, I totally agree with her. I mean, it, 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 the, the problem is, at the end of the day, is the, found, the founders never intended the federal government, farthest removed from the people, to be making decisions based off of public comment. If, if the states are operating a program like this, a commissioner or a director or a governor can't get away from the public that he, that he or she affects. These guys get to fly in, have a couple public meetings, right. and fly out. Yeah. And you, and you have no way to access these folks. You do have a way to access your local leaders, your state leaders, and that's what our forefathers intended. And, and consistency is the other issue related to this cooperation and consistency with the state's plans and and that is not happening either well stated okay we'll, we'll get back on that after the uh, top they are right now roll call for august the 10th um as always very painful uh last week we lost army major general harold j green uh, when an Afghan soldier uh, <clears throat> went hay- haywire and uh, turned an automatic weapon on uh, uh, an, an instructional class, there was a total of eight people killed. Uh, Major General Harold Green, 55, of New York, signed as Deputy Commanding General of the Combined Security Transition uh, Command in Afghanistan, died of wounds caused by small arms fire in an insider attack in Kabul, Afghanistan. John? Army Staff Sergeant Gerard D. Gass, Jr. He died August 3rd, 2014, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. He was 33 years old of Lumberbridge, North Carolina, assigned to the 1st Battalion, 3rd Special Forces Group out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He died in a Jalalabad Airfield Hospital in Afghanistan from a non-combat-related incident while on patrol in Nangarhar Province of Afghanistan. As always, uh, folks, uh, this is the price for your pre- freedom last week. Uh, two freedom tickets got punched. Think about that just for a minute. I'm Don McDowell. We'll be right back. The man that fears no fish, Bass Daddy and Tournament Pro, Don McDowell. All righty, we're back. Uh, thanks for joining the uh, second hour of Shake, Rattle, and Troll with J.K., Commissioner Davis. And um, wh- what's your proper title? Retired. Uh, instigator. Iconoglass. Yeah. I'll, okay, I'll take instigator, instigator of the Mexican Grey Wolf. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, Terry Johnson, we're going to take you uh, right now aboard the uh, sport vessel Malahini with Captain Bill driving the boat. Captain, what's happening today? Hey, good morning, guys. And actually, I'm on the beach for a change, okay? Uh-oh. That's oh, a, no, that's a good thing. Is it? Me. That's a very good thing. It's been, it's been very, very steady, you know. Uh, anywhere from, I want to say, 50 to 170 fish a day, you know, for, for uh, the Malahini as far as uh, yellow fin go. 
Well, we, we, we gave your uh, uh, boat count out uh, for Friday uh, earlier. We're looking at Saturday's count today. And yeah. you, you guys are just whacking and packing them on, on the Malahini. Absolutely. How far are you guys actually having to run uh, after you uh, leave the bait receiver? Uh, it depends. We're seeing fish from 11 miles to 32 miles. It seems like the oh. volume of the fish. It seems like the volume of the fish is in between 25 to 32 miles. From 16 miles off of Mexico to 35 miles off of Mexico. That nice. Makes sense. How many, how many, nice. Captain, how, how many years has it been since we've seen fish in uh, this stellar? That's uh, 2004. Wow. 2004, I'm guessing. Yep. I mean, it's, I mean you have, you have skiffs catching yellowfin at what we call the Nine Mile Bank. That's, that's pretty close to home. You know, we, we fished the Nine Mile Bank two weeks ago. It was steady, 100, 120, 110, 100, and so forth. And so on. We stayed in the hundred for about eight days, and then it died off. And then we moved back into the uh, islands for uh, eight days, and it was phenomenal yellowtail fishing there. And then we decided, like dummies, to go back offshore again. And guess what? We've been offshore ever since. You know, we we do that sometimes. We make a decision to leave fish to go find fish. How many times have you done that, Terry? Three. That's a bad thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, well, it's. It, it's worked out, you know. I mean, it's worked out for the most part. This is the first time since I've owned the boat that we've been sold out three weeks in advance. Holy cow! Yeah, I mean, the it, next available reservation for the Malayani is, I do believe, September eighth. Wow! And it's been like that, that since the third week of July. Well, I guess J.K. We're going to have to sneak on in the stealth of night and stole away aboard the Malahini down in the engine room. You know what pirates exactly. do? <laughs> we're gonna become we're gonna become tuna pirates. We're gonna come over. We're gonna take over the boat and we're going out. I don't know. Maybe we oh, could hire yeah. honest crew. Well, maybe here I got nothing planned for the eighth and ninth and tenth. <laughs> let, let, let's book I'm it. Really sorry I missed you guys. You know that was a uh, you guys were busy. Uh, the Sea Adventure eighty was busy, and uh, man, you know it was a whack and pack them. Uh, trip we had uh, commissioner we had 31 anglers on the sea adventure 80 uh for a day and a half trip uh i think total boat count was 353 wow. and, and, oh, that, that's and, and, and that's not counting i mean we were having uh five six seven eight uh yellow fins hooked up at a time and there was like pow pop snap <laughs> damn, damn oh yeah oh yeah oh, our, our first stop of the day we got ruined I don't think I, I don't I don't believe our passengers were really in store for what was ahead. We hooked twenty five we hooked twenty five fish and got seven. Nice. Ooh. There's a oh, whole lot of unhappy guys. Rate was high, okay, yesterday. <laughs> but I mean that's that's that that in a sense is just part of fishing, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah, I get it. I it's totally just get part it. Part of fishing. Uh what else? Gosh, it's it's just it's it's it has really been a wonderful summer, guys. It really has. Well, God love you and for I, uh, playing along today. Uh, what, what was the next opening you guys have? Uh, September 8th, I do believe. We have like six spots available. <clears throat> I think we ought to take those six spots, gentlemen, right here. <laughs> we have one, two, three, four, five of us. We'll grab Donnie. Uh, we can fill up two uh, rams. and uh, I'm good for it. You good, Commissioner? September. I'm trying to think. I'm supposed to be hunting. I think. Yeah. That, no. Unfortunately, I know uh -oh. I will be getting yeah. ready. What? Getting ready doesn't count. I've got to be up there. I'm getting ready to go hunting. That's like saying I'm. I'm going to bring the bullets, and you're standing in front of a bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I've been ripped. Okay. Okay. Very little. <laughs> I'll remember that. I got a hook for you. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll be in uh, after we get back from the uh, wolf meeting next week. Uh, I'll give you a call. Oh, I've got your landline, and uh, maybe we can set something up and get uh, Terry and the commissioner and J.K. over there finally. That's a commission meeting, I believe. That's what it is. Oh, oh. That, would, that would definitely work. What is the commissioner? Absolutely. If I may, what does he do? <laughs> commissioner of Wildlife? I yeah. mean, is he a Commissioner of Wildlife or yeah. something like that? Yes, yeah. okay. this is from the uh, the uh, Arizona Game and Fish Department. This is one of our premier uh, commissioners. 
And by the way, he they do a hell of a job. They're not paid for it. They donate all of their time. They take the abuse from the public, and they make decisions that affect all wildlife in the state of Arizona. And I personally appreciate the fact that they're able to come down here and do that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now Ooh, I have uh, another question for you guys, Uh-oh. if I may. You have Alina Hunt and... Javelina hunting in Yuma. Is there a season for that? Yes. <laughs> so back to you, you can actually take two down in the Yuma area. That's right. You can take two, but it's during a season, and you have to have a license, and you better have a, a, tag. a tag. They are they Which are not get. targets of opportunity anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. You'll, you'll, have, you'll, you'll put in by I'll October, Captain. My uncle. Say you'll, again, sir? You'll put in for tag by October. We would love to have you come out and... Okay. Some javelina around. And them. the price for the tag? What is it now for javelina? There, I think it's like $22 yeah. for the tag, but uh, the out of state license will probably run you about 160 Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't mean that's fine, but yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, the price of the tag is going up next year, but courtesy you, of that comment from the public. Yeah, <laughs> that's oh, fine. Man. Oh, man. <laughs> but you get to come fishing with that as well. That's true. Yes, you can. You can fish here. Oh, really? Yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. With the license? For yes. The... You get your hunt and fish. It's a combo you get both. Oh, very nice. It's okay. actually a What's much better deal. Thing? It's a much better deal than the license structure in California. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I didn't say that too loud, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. All, All right. right. It was a pleasure talking to you all. Hey, uh, check it out. Any of your uh, listeners who want to get on the boat, they can call the landing office at 619 619- Two 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 one one four four, and just let the landing you know, office know they want to make uh, book a trip for the uh, Malahine. I mean, guys, fishing is phenomenal. Good it stuff, and it's good in a very, very long time. It's a pleasure talking with you guys. Have a great day. All right, Captain Bill, <laughs> outstanding, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Have you seen the Malahine boat? No, I never. Uh, have. This boat is has some historical value. It's it's a converted World War II PT boat. Yeah. So yeah. it's seaworthy. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it's been re-outfitted. It's got quite a history as a uh, a private yacht after it... Uh, Didn't it go to Russia? Bill says no. I say yes. Uh, I'm not going to argue with the captain. I've learned that that's a uh, bad thing to do. It's a lose-lose proposition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not good, but I think it was the PT-671, uh, and it was commissioned in uh, 1945, and we had a, uh, a Lynn Shear program with Russia at that time. Uh, the information I had, you, you know, we may have the PT numbers mixed up, uh, but whatever. It went to Russia, came back, uh, uh, was ported out of uh, Washington. Somebody bought it, converted it to a sport boat. That didn't work out. It was re-outfitted, converted to a research boat, converted to a sport fishing vessel a couple of different times. Manny bought it. Uh, a long time ago, gosh, back in, well, I'm dating myself, um, back in the 60s, I believe, he passed away. These guys got it. Uh, it's been cleaned up. And uh, <clears throat> when you look at it, you can actually see where the uh, torpedo tubes were mounted. And I suggested because the Mexican uh, fishing cooperativa influence that we put the torpedoes back on it and deal with the uh, tuna pin tenders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, having said that, when we come back, I don't know what in the world we're going to do, but we're going to do something. I'm Don McDowell. JK. Kirk Davis. Terry Johnson. We'll be back. All righty, we're back. Uh, we're going to dispense with talking with Rick over at H&M Landing, uh, only because the fishing is just outstanding. Uh, their uh, dock count yesterday, the... Um, Day boats had 240 anglers on 10 vessels, 889 yellow fin, 195 yellow tail, 47 dorado. And the question just went through my mind, why am I wasting time going to a wolf meeting at Pine Top? You could be going <laughs> the same amount California. of time, Commissioner. We can be in yeah. downtown San Diego. <laughs> Trust me, we'll get, we'll get on that boat. Uh, the, the day and a half boats had uh, two boats out. Don't quite get that. Uh, 57 anglers, 156 yellow fin, 11 dorado, 8 yellow tail, a little bit light. And the uh, three-quarter day boats, five boats were out, 132 anglers, 61 yellow tail, 181 yellow fin, 14 blue fin, and a dorado. There's some good eating out there. Man, yeah. 
Oh, that's right. I still haven't seen a fillet yet. Have I? Uh, no, but uh, you know, we're we're, we're going to do you a favor. We're going to cook you some, okay. and then we'll send you home home from some. And and because uh, we missed your birthday, there's a birthday card. Oh boy! And J.K. as as much hiking as you do, you're becoming older. This is this walking stick was handcrafted by Joey Nacha. Oh my! It does not have elk horn on it. It has elk antlers. Oh my, that's beautiful. And a nice tip that uh, I can stab the nearest uh, wolf that comes after me. Or it works yeah. well at the Walmart. Wow, I, I would think it would work even better with uh, some of the officials that'll be at the meeting on Monday. Oh, I can go in as a Hungarian tribal chief as they had the last go. time at yeah. their wolf meeting. And can, oh yeah, and yeah. you can probe them very nicely. Yes, with I that. probing questions. <laughs> yes. Well, we uh, thought that beautiful. would be appropriate. Uh, Joey does some <clears throat> nice work with uh, antlers up there. and uh, Oh, yeah, he does. This will help me in the hills. I can't use my walking sticks on a hunt because the carbide tips make too much noise. This with a rubber tip will help me get up those hills. So you can sneak up on them? Well, my biggest thing is my my left knee. I, I mean, it's just bone on bone, and I've had two scope jobs already. Well, I'm I sorry. that. Anymore. I wish I'd have known that. That that's a right right handed walking stick. It is not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Come on, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I gave me pause for a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh you know, I really think uh you know, with the schedules being what they are and in in today's pressure being what it is, I, I think only a uh, a trip during the week would be appropriate. That'd be fun. <laughs> It would be. <laughs> I smell a trip coming. Yeah. Well, all I did was uh, uh, wash the reels off, re-oil, wipe the rods down. We're ready. And I have my rim country. You'll appreciate this. James Guggenauer built me a bath rod. Oh. Seven-footer. And he says, oh, if I take that and throw it out in the yellow tail, I go, nope, going to snap it. He says... If you break it, I'll build you another one. Yeah. All right, I'm I'm good with that. Second day out, or uh, beginning of the second day, the yellowtail are just stupid. And uh, Dorado, same way. You know, we, we're coming up on a patty, and I'm thinking, wow. Okay, this is it. So I tie on a five-and-a-half-inch uh, swim bait, ounce-and-a-half head, throw it out there. Got bit, you know, within just a, a matter of uh, a few cranks. And I'm thinking, all right, if this thing's going to work, let, let's see. So I put it, put the uh, rod in my butt holder, reared back on it, and I want to tell you what, we've got some video of that rod. It's got about a two and a half foot, uh, very active uh, tip. Yeah. The rest of it's all backbone, and I think there was eight or nine yellowtail came in off that, and it was wow. just absolutely a blast. That's impressive. I've, I've yeah. got some Dobbin swim bait rods that uh, I'm not sure would hold up to that. Well, James did, uh, and I'll tell you, you, you that video's on the website, uh, shakerattleandtroll.com. And, uh, I'm going to go look for that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it was good stuff. Commissioner, have you spent much time offshore? No, I or really haven't. inshore, no, as I, it were? Actually, when I was growing up as a kid, uh, there were many trips off of Ensenada. Um, oh, yeah. But since I moved inland, um, very rarely, a little time in Alaska. Well, you've got a very handsome... Uh, uh, EcoBoost Ford out there that uh, w- it is. Know? It's an EcoBoost. EcoBoost. Did I say Eagle Boost? <laughs> <laughs> That's the Prius. Let, 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 me, let me take care of the Eagle part. He's got it parked in the handicap part. Oh, okay. Okay. So, <laughs> that's good. Wow. Yeah, I really think we ought to get together and uh, uh, go hang out with Captain Bill on the Mail Haney. It's an easy trip. We leave early in the morning. You get back at uh, around five in the afternoon. Go by Santana's, have a have a burrito, and uh, head, head back home. Be back in, back in Phoenix by one fifteen, say in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Worst case scenario. I'm up for it. I'm telling you now. Uh, unless there's a commission meeting on the Wolf on on <laughs> one of those days. I'm going to check priority. the calendar. Um, Let's see. What do you say? I no longer I no sense. longer plan my life in a, according to commission meetings anymore. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I'm happy. <laughs> okay, here. The 8th and the 9th is a Monday and a Tuesday. That's yeah, I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. And is 8th is um, Labor Day, is it not? Monday. Uh, or is that the 1st? That's on the 1st. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we, we, we can still go shoot doves. You can 
practice your archery skills, and then we can go whack fish Monday, Tuesday. Because I'll just be coming back from Canada with uh, walleyes and, and northern some pike, muskies, nice. some pike and, and hopefully some musky. I won't be bringing a musky back with me. No, you won't. No, no. But say before we go on, I wonder if I could just add something. Uh, you know, we've uh, remembered that the some of America's uh, servicemen who have died in, in service to the country, but I want to just remind people that we still have soldiers missing from Vietnam. A lot of them are still missing, and, uh, and I'm wearing a bracelet today that is uh, in me- remembrance of uh, Staff Sergeant uh, James C. Thomas, and he was lost on April 3rd of 1968. And I just want to remind people we still have missing. And pe- some people are still working hard to bring them back. I wore a bracelet before this that was uh, Captain Gordon Blackwood, and his remains were recovered uh, just four years ago. Nice. Uh, and he was lost in 1968 as well. So just something to keep in mind. There is there still active work between the Vietnamese government and the United States government in terms of trying to identify remains? There is active active recovery still still going Good. on. America's not going to forget its servicemen, uh, no. but it, it's something low key. It may have been lost by the public in general. But there are websites and there are organizations that are just as focused as could be. Now there are grandchildren yeah. uh, involved in this, of course, uh, trying to recover the remains of, of parents, of, of mothers or fathers that, that perhaps they never even knew. Yeah, the grandparents yeah. that they never knew. Yeah. Okay. So, just Good. Yeah, well, we agree. missed uh, Vern today, and Vern uh, is the uh, the um, founder of the Military Families Foundation. Uh, I happen to sit on that board, and uh, last week we've made some headway uh, with the discount cab company, um, a lot of the, uh, in, in specific, we're talking about uh, the remaining uh, World War II uh, veterans. A lot of Vietnam veterans categorically fit into this uh, scenario that I'm going to paint for you. Uh, we had a 87-year-old WW2 veteran that had uh, li- li- still lives in the West Valley, has to go to Scottsdale for outpatient chemotherapy. Had no family, couldn't drive. We paid a lot of money getting this soldier to and from, and uh, there, there's a little bit of a hiccup with the VA and their inability to take care of these guys. So long story short, uh, what what we're in the process of solidifying is a deal with the discount cab company to come pick these soldiers up, uh, uh, whatever their case is, and take them to their treatment. Uh, we've got another situation. Prescott doesn't do VA stuff anymore so those guys are having to come down here which is another burden so you've got phoenix tucson and the discount cab company and you'll love this part one of the largest prius purchasers on the planet they happen to have 500 green prius cabs running around Uh, we will rule the world eventually (laughs) i'm thinking ram spell it um but they're they're going to give us uh, the ability to uh, uh, have the software so that we, in conjunction with VA, can control the appointments of you as a veteran. You call in. We make the appointment on their software. It goes to them. They pick you up, deliver you, come back, get you, take you back home. We get that at cost, which is a huge deal. We're going to do a, a 90-day trial run and then expand that into uh, Tucson and, and some other places. So uh, Ver, Vern's working hard on it. And, and Vern is, is, is um, he, he's part of the process. He lives in uh, Rimrock, um, been laced with Agent Orange, has the congenital heart failure due to that. Uh, he's short and was a lieutenant, so, I mean, he's got issues. He was lucky he wasn't <laughs> fragged. <laughs> well, you know, he's like master support, former Master Sergeant Dempsey. Uh, you know, he said, because I'm short, I hit the ground faster, <laughs> and I'm harder to hit. So that, that, that's their claim to fame. But, uh, yeah, I've, uh, we're, we're working hard to do that. But what we're finding, uh, Commissioner, and, and, and you kind of hit it on the head with some of your comments, whether it's a uh, endangered species issue, uh, a wolf issue, or a veteran issue, we're seeing the same lack of response, uh, too much autonomy, no accountability, people that don't give a damn, and, and in, the, in the situation of, with the VA, a union. We're dealing with a union, and I was dumbfounded when I found that out. I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing, but... Anyway, enough of that. When we come back, the Rim Country Custom Rod Fishing Report on the Mother Lake on Roosevelt. I'm Don McDowell with Special K and K. 
Kurt Davis. And Terry Johnson. We'll be right back. When they took them away, back in the grass. Left my truck at the boat ramp and my boat is full of gas. My old boss thinks I'm sick today. He won't have me to harass. Cause I'm out here on the river. You can kiss my big old bass. Everybody say, James, what's happening up there? Hey, good morning, Don. How are you? You know, I, I'm in really good company today, and uh, I appreciate you playing along. Well, I've been listening uh, to, through the website there, and uh, yes, yeah, very good show today, Commissioner Davis. I agree with uh, everything you're saying with rules, and uh, look forward to the meeting on Monday. Does that mean you don't dis or don't agree with anything that Terry <laughs> has said? We agree with Terry. We like Terry. <laughs> okay, I, I'm just checking. I do to an extent, you know. I, I'm Ooh. A, a research guy. I'm an analytical type of person. Well, you guys are both Ranger drivers, so you know we report you all figured out. <laughs> and and as I, you know, I've been engaged probably for like a year with this uh, wolf issue. But as I go back and read articles, go back to 1998 to present day, the same issues are being debated. So nothing has really progressed. Nobody's been convinced one way or the other that it's the right thing. I don't think anybody's mind has been changed. So I'm one. My history tells me that when you deal with something for 16 years and you've got the same issues that you started with, it's time to blow up that process and start over. Thank you. So, I mean, one, I appreciate the, the Game of Fish bulletin that, that came out. But, uh, you know, putting uh, withdrawal from the program at the end, uh, you know, kind of leaves a lot of room for discussion, a lot of room for us to be talking about the same issue 10 years from now. But Take- if you put that at the top, then then you get some attention and maybe we could uh, get some changes. And that's just that's my opinion. It takes two parties to have a discussion, just yeah. so you know. And if one of them is an autocrat, then it's a little bit difficult to have anything. Yeah. But the point's well taken, actually, that you're just a little bit short on time frame. The issues that you're talking about from 98 uh, through now are the same issues I identified in slides uh, that I used with the commissioners in 1985 and 1987. And they're the same issues that existed 10 years before that uh, with the uh, the Red Wolf in the southeastern uh, part of the country and with uh, with the discussions of reintroductions in the northern Rockies. And those are the same issues that you'll be talking about in the year 2114. <laughs> Ooh, I don't like the look on the commissioner's face on that one. Ah, they're, they're Certainly be nice to, you know, as Commissioner Davis was saying, you know, if we use historical information, we know where these wolves were located at one time. Take those percentages, use that as a baseline, and go put forward a plan that aligns to that. I mean, that to me is a common sense approach, and it seems like everybody ought to be able to agree to that that type of a process, or at least that starting point. For, and uh, at least there's some rationale and, and understanding, some scientifically based information to why the decisions get made. But that's the greatest fallacy in the whole process is is, is an assumption that uh, people actually want to use science, logic, and reason to make these decisions, because those are the first thing, those are the first things that are thrown out of the game, uh, and they're thrown out of the game on on both sides largely, and it becomes a matter of your science versus my science, and who decides what science is, and what's a fact, and what's a ninety five percent probability, and all those sorts of things. The reality here is that you're dealing with a philosophical issue that is, is broader than the Endangered Species Act, and that is restoration, not recovery. And restoration is the agenda of many of the pro-wolf people who want to see wolves uh, distributed across the entire country, whether it was historical range or not. And then those of uh, folks that uh, that are in the middle and want to see recovery take place, and then those folks that are on the other extreme and don't want to see wolves at all. So you've got this huge philosophical battle that underlies everything here. And then the, the bigger one for me personally, this Terry Johnson speaking, is the the issue of state versus federal uh, control of wildlife. Bingo. And that yeah. is central to this whole thing. People should not lose sight of that. This is a question here to be answered as to whether the state actually has the authorities that have been conveyed to it or Fish and Wildlife Service is going to be allowed to abrogate those authorities and simply do what it wants to do, how it wants to do it. 
that is the seminal issue yep. in all of the – and so this issue bleeds into other issues. Terry's absolutely right. At the end of the day, the most fundamental, most important part of this is maintaining the state's primacy over the management of its wildlife held in trust yep. for the people of the Arizona. state of Arizona. And Thank that, you. that is the most fundamental – I do – can I ask Terry a question, though, because he's yep. – I would trust this is all for you guys. I ask all the time, Terry, and you know this, is what is the number to recovery? There is no number to recovery. and uh, you, I mean, no legally established number. And, uh, biological. Terry, though, you're the but, king for a day. What would you what, say? What do we need to achieve? I'm talking about, about through fif- the arrangement. 1,500 to 2,000 wolves is, is really what you need to have an, ass- an assurance of sustainability if it is managed as a meta population comprised of three subpopulations, right. a bigger one in Mexico right. and a smaller, a smaller population in, in, in New Mexico and another one in Arizona. And you have exchange between those. And that exchange can be through natural movement or it can Transplant. be in wildlife assisted, uh, yes. wildlife right. management assisted. Uh, locations. Then you've got some some certainty of recovery. See, that's the other part from my from my perspective. For those who, of us that aren't experts like you are, is having people understand what does you know what would be success. So right. if you look, for example, at the recommendation, uh, the the draft from the from the feds from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they there is no marker. There is no number. No, exactly. no numbers. You, now, you, if you don't have a number, you have no idea where you're going. If yeah. I look at a map and I don't decide what my destination is, I can never get to my destination. And we've been and saying that's that since 1996. A, and that's not on accident. No, not, a, not on accident People need to understand that's not on accident. That if, is on If purpose. you look at the Northern Rockies right now, what, what the service has, has successfully accomplished is the establishment of wool population that is larger then it's sustainable if you assume that, that hunting is legitimate use of, of uh, public yes. lands and private lands. And so what they, they've convinced us all to do is manage downward uh, to a number that would actually uh, closer to what it should have been at the beginning. Now down here, if they, if they go with unlimited, we're going to see 5, 10, 15 years of wolves, of wolf population growth without any mitigating capability on the parts of the states. Right. And that's going in a drought driven Wool, in a drought-driven ungulate situation, that's the kiss of death. Right. We don't have the rains they have and the snowpacks they have up there. Right. All right. Hold that thought. We'll we'll finish that up. James, what do you have on the fishing report, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> I'm by and by. Either that, or just tell us the fishing's good, and we'll go back to uh, Terry Johnson no. here. No, no, I. Uh you know, part of my charter here is to make sure uh, we improve knowledge of fishermen for their weekly fishing trips to Roosevelt. Bass fishing on Roosevelt Lake was good this past week. Perfect. Now, we've been talking about this change of season, and it's happening. I mean, I can see it with the elk up here. I can see it with the fish in Roosevelt Lake. The bass are chasing shad in shallow portions of the cove. That Woo-hoo! Hurt. That is typically a fall-type activity, and it's starting to happen already. Now, the duration of that bite varies from day to day, but week over week, it's getting stronger. So the fish already sense that there's a change coming in the season, and, uh, you know, they're starting to react that way. This morning, this morning, James, I have to tell you, uh, today was the first day that it smelled like dove season yep. at, at sunrise. Yep, and yeah. let me go in one other sentence here off the fishing report. You know those uh, elk that I've been talking to you about for a month or so that have yes. been following this summer? Yeah, they're little 5x5 five five hanging out back by you. Right, they're gone. I mean, something has, I don't know if it's the full moon, but I haven't seen a elk for a week, and that is significantly different than it's been for three months. A little bit of a migratory change, plus I think the bulls at this point are starting to start rubbing off their velvet. It's the, That's that time. Well, let's go back on something that matters, and that's the fishing report here from Roosevelt Lake. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, uh, a question for you, James, uh, and I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you that, that I know unless you've been at a wolf meeting and yelling at me about the, the things that you partially disagree with me on. But a uh, question about the Roosevelt. Where's the lake Where's the lake elevation now in uh, relative to Rabbit Island and uh, the humps out there? Uh, how much of, uh, is exposed? Uh, the, the lake this week is at 39% full. 39 and Rabbit Island is well exposed. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's one of the favorite fishing places in the morning, uh, probably where you're going with this. 
Yeah. It's a bass place to chase shad up into those uh, islands, into that shallow water. So that's a great fishing place early in the morning. Well, I don't want to spread rumors, but uh, if you turn it around and you fish at night, which is my plan because I, I hate the day, uh, and you fished out there with a 15 to 17 inch worm and, uh, custom pours, uh, Upton worms are good. Uh, those in a big crankbait like a DD22 or even the, the SX10s, uh, the, you fish those breaks around Rabbit Island and that's big fish stuff. I had 13 fish there last, uh, September. It's a fisherman and wolf's clothing, My man. boys. Yeah, between, yeah. <laughs> between seven and nine pounds and that's as good as it gets for me. Why aren't you on the fishing council? <laughs> Because then it would be work. You need to help James and I with the, with, with the fishing issues. <laughs> God. Hey, let me let me tell you a couple of them. With these bass that are chasing on the surface, you know, a lot of top water bait uh, that we're uh, guys were talking about. But a Zoom Super Fluke, which runs just under the water, has just just the second week in a row now getting reports on that. Uh, just killer. Now, the key that the local anglers are saying that once... James, you're going to have to hold that thought. We need to flip into a break. We'll uh, be back. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll finish this up real quick. Okay. All righty, we're back. We're going to finish that up. We're going to re- go back and rename that song Blood on the Shovel. <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> All right, James, let's, let's get the Mother Lake finished up, my friend. All right. Hey, uh, after the sun comes up, uh, the top water bite is going to die down as soon as that sunlight hits the water. So you want to go uh, fish the bottom. Uh, two baits that are successful there. One is a three-eighth to one-half pound jig made by Clifford Perch Outdoors. The other <laughs> <is> <laughs> you tell Clifford that just cost him 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is a Texas rig Warbo one. Uh, uh, mostly in a translucent color, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the, like the morning dawn colors are pretty popular. Or people's uh, robo worm is popular, but but if, after the sun comes up, you're definitely going to be fishing the bottom for the for the rest of the day down there. Well, since Terry's let the cat out of the bag there on uh, the big worms at Rabbit Island, uh, one, one thing that is uh, pretty consistent uh, between uh, 11:35 and uh, noon. Fishing around there on the east side where that little cut is, yeah, with the top water bait, very aggressively, uh, about the first couple of casts, and then uh, convert it to a uh, finesse retrieval. Okay, they will come up in, in little wolf packs. Let's say, God, I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to come up with I'm another. either going to be there at Canyon Lake on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday instead of these these wolf meetings. So. Uh, uh, coward. I'll put this well. I'm coward. Yeah. <laughs> you've been you've been beaten enough. You look, deserve to be fishing look, anytime you want. Our yes. goal is to get a sea of red shirts out there. James, you didn't email me back on what size shirt you wanted to wear up there on Monday. Well, mine will be an extra large. Okay. All right. <laughs> See that 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 that's this whole thing is real simple. You want fifteen hundred. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, and we'll say that ten percent of the Mexican gray wolf historical range was here so that's 150 that we grant amnesty to the rest of them send them south yeah well uh, agreed our, our, no um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you said 112 if if uh if it were a question of habitat being equally distributed in terms of quality, no, I would no, agree no, with no, 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 no. But it's on, not. So my upper limit for Arizona and New Mexico is 300 wolves. Yes. You know, 250 to 300. I, 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 I'm, I'm good range. with that. Yeah. And the rest of them get amnesty. The rest of them get amnesty. No, no amnesty. No amnesty. The rest of them should be south of Mexi- south of uh, the border. Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks for listening. Yeah. <laughs> okay, James, finish it up, man. we got to get out of here. Okay, let me put in uh, for the crappie anglers that they come up here. Um, I was talking to Kurt Rambo, uh, the Tano Basin crappie angler, uh, retired guide up there. Uh, Kurt is still catching 20 to 25 uh, crappie in about three hours in the morning from 8 o'clock until about 11 o'clock. You're fishing in deeper water this week. He's down to 30 feet. So you're looking for brush. Wow. Feet. You're fishing vertically. And he said that the longer our weather stays stable, like it has been, we haven't had any great monsoons here the last week or so, that those crappie schools will grow this time of year. So he's seen them get bigger, but he is saying they're in deeper water. 
Yeah, he would know. He would know. He's yeah. the guy. Well, we yep. got a front coming in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what it does with that. Yeah, that's an interesting drive up up through there uh, during the rainy season, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> you going to the uh, commission or the uh, Wolf Meeting Commissioner? I don't. I don't believe I can. I actually. That's true. I don't I know that you can. <laughs> well, they aren't going to let me talk, anyways. But um, if I can, down I will. It's a work-related issue. I got to. I do have my paid job I've got to do. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we details, all do. Details, <laughs> details, details. <laughs> James, how many folks are uh, engaging uh, from the patient area that you're aware of at this point? Well, I've talked to uh, several, especially since the article got published in the, in the Roundup. Uh, sounds like we're going to have a bigger turnout than we did last time. So I think uh, I've talked to a dozen guys who said that they plan on driving over. Cool. All right, anything else to add on behalf of Room Country Custom Rods? Nope, I appreciate the opportunity, and um, I'll see uh, you tomorrow, I guess, Don, up there at the meeting. Roger that. Don, is this the fellow who built that, that rod? You were this this would be the man that built that, that oh, rod. Oh, James, um, I've never had anything to do with wolves, and I hate them. Um, so I'd like to talk to you at some point about a custom rod. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that sucking noise you hear is uh, Terry Johnson. <laughs> oh, my God. I'll be, be happy to do that. Thanks. All right. Great job on that rod, man. All Thanks, right. Man. We're going to uh, get this thing wrapped up. We've got uh, NASCAR to watch today and a nap to take. And I'm not sure how uh, this race is going to go. Certainly a tragedy yesterday with Tony Stewart killing the other driver, Kevin in our Ward, I think his name was. Yeah. Yeah, that was certainly uh, unfortunate, and I'm sure nothing uh, intentional on Tony Stewart's part. No. But, uh, Commissioner, do you have anything to add uh, after I thank you for coming down? I, you know, your time is like ours, very precious, uh, early Sunday morning. Thank you for coming. No, thank you for what you guys are doing, and I and I think your admission to the to the uh, folks that are on the website and the, to to make those phone calls. And I would use your talking points absolutely at the at the public meeting, which at the end of the day is we have cooperators in our state, 28 of them. Yes. Wow. Uh, who have come up with a scientifically based plan that can work and keep the talking points to banging away on that message that we have 28, you have one. And uh, we'd like some respect uh, for the science that's been done by these by these uh, excellent individuals that have given so much time. Mr. Johnson? No, I, I would encourage all of your listeners uh, to recruit, not just recruit more hunters to make sure that, uh, that that we carry on this sport for eternity, but to recruit membership for the organizations that are actually fronting this effort. Uh, they need more people uh, signed on to them, and, and they need more people contributing money to make the, the litigation happen. Uh, you're looking at litigation uh, that's going to be, be costing between $150,000 at an absolute minimum for filing, et cetera, and a million dollars total to achieve what you want to achieve. And that's going to be over the next year or two. So engage. Engage. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, AZS, FWC, ADA, and uh, those groups are uh, you know, kind of leading the charge. Uh, John, what was the expose on that uh, June uh, 2012 on CBD uh, uh, litigation money paid? Oh, uh, Doc Hastings said that uh, they had uh, in a committee report. <clears throat> that Department the, of Justice. Yeah, that uh, the Center for Biological Diversity tried to tell them that they had only taken in $550,000 in equal access to justice money. And Doc Hastings said, excuse me. Between the years of 2009 and 2012, you and your attorneys, some of which are on staff, just because the checks weren't made out to the Center for Biological Bingo. Diversity yeah. doesn't mean you weren't paid for it, came to well over $3.5 million. And that's just for that three-year period. Because there are no, there was no documentation, no That's GL, on our website as well. Yeah, there was no accountability during the years from 1994 till 2010 as to where the monies went. There was no general accounting office administrative checking to see where the equal access to justice money went they don't know they have yeah. no clue but i guarantee you it's with in the billions with a b the unequal access to unequal. lawyers thank Act. you That's yeah 
Hey, Don, if you have two seconds, one quick one quick parting shot here. People need to recognize the Fish and Wildlife Service does not intend this uh, to end with this, uh, this these meetings and this decision in January. They intend to repeat this entire process beginning in February 2015, uh, bring a recovery plan out, and then redo the entire EIS and, and non-essential experimental population rule review. So you're going to go through the same damn costly exercise over the next three years that you've just been part of for the last Terry, how do we stop them? You can't. It's part of the process. Congressional pressure yeah. is the only, and congressional pressure and litigation are the That's only true. two things. Does it, uh, since Dan Ash is a, a political appointee, we, we change the administration on the Hill, shuffle it downstream? About all you can do is, is hope for, for a change in administration or administrative philosophy. Commissioner, you're pretty uh, uh, actively and highly involved in our political scheme. Uh, um, if you can, what is your uh, prognosis for our next governor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Don't. How about lottery numbers? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm a betting man on the Republican side, it would be Doug Ducey facing and it'll be Fred Duvall on the Democrat side. Well, okay. Mr. Ducey, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, well, you've got to call into his camp. I do. Okay. All righty, that's it. Hope you learned something. Check out all this information, uh, what the department's uh, doing for us on uh, azgfd.gov. Uh, you catch all of our information as we interpret it on shakerattletroll.com, as well as Terry's uh, good works on the cooperating agency's alternative MGW plan. I'm Don McDowell. J.K. Kurt Davis. Terry Johnson. Thank you guys for coming down. Hey, take your kids fish and hug your bass boat and whack a tuna. We're out of here. Bye, Ray.